All right, perfect. Um, so before we begin, um, once again, for those that haven't already, we ask that um, PVM students write your name in the chat box so we can ensure that your presence is accounted for for the certificate. Um, so this series was designed and um, it aims to provide better understanding of veterinary medicine um, and its impact throughout the world and give you a comprehensive view of the various career paths available to veterinary professionals by way of virtual trip around the world. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're in Ireland right now. You can see, you can see the background. Um, overall, these <laughs> sessions are designed for you to place your career in a larger global framework. And so um, this special session, we'll be interviewing with Dr. Claire Hawks. I believe all of, I spotlighted her video, so you all should be able to see her. Um, we'll be interviewing with Dr. Claire Hawks. Um, Dr. Claire Hawks is a recognized European specialist in equine surgery and one of three directors at the Sycamore Lodge Equine Hospital, a hospital located in Kildare, which is world famous for staging the most exciting racing events in Ireland. Um, Dr. Hawks graduated from the University of Queensland in 2003. Um, she started her veterinary career in an internship in equine medicine and surgery at Randwick Equine Center in Sydney before moving to the UK before moving to the UK in 2005. There she spent time in equine referral and first opinion practice before completing a three-year residency in equine surgery at the University of Edinburgh, generously funded by the Horse Race Betting Levy Board. Um, in addition to gaining invaluable experience of specialist cases in her residency, Dr. Hawks attained her RCVS certificate in equine surgery, soft tissue, and was awarded a Master's of Science by research for her thesis investigating the muscles of the equine soft palate. In 2011, Dr. Hawks passed her European College of Veterinary Surgery Diploma Examination, making her a European specialist in equine, in equine surgery. Whilst enjoying all forms of equine surgery, including colic and arthroscopy, fracture repair, and minimally invasive surgery, her special interest lies in respiratory surgery and the investigation of dynamic respiratory tract obstructions in the racehorse. Um, Dr. Hawks has published and presented to peers on respiratory and dental conditions of horses, and she is also a great friend to the Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine and has hosted many of our students for internships in the Sycamore Equine Lodge for about the past four years. Um, we're so thankful that you are here to join us today. Um, I felt bad the last time because when the students are muted and so we can't give you a big hand, so I would do that for them. <laughs> there we go. You are appreciated. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll get right down to it, Dr. Hawks. Um, how are you in your hospital adjusting to the changes um, caused by COVID-19? How's everything going? Uh, everything's going pretty well, actually, to be honest. I mean, we, you know, the, when when it first hit, there was a you know a, a bit of apprehension and panic, and it was at the start of our spring stud season there, so um, we're expecting to be coming into a busy time of year for us. And uh, we you know we had uh, multiple students in the hospital at that time, and and many more due to be coming uh, with us. So that was one area where we had to um, make a call on and. Uh, we we had two extern students that were with us um, for uh, four weeks prior to to the restrictions coming in there, and were due to stay with us um, until the end of end of June um, there. So they 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 got to stay, um, and everyone else who was travelling up and down and you know, coming to the hospital uh, and not not staying in our intern house or or in local accommodation was um was you know, not allowed to stay in the hospital also reduced staff numbers but uh in terms of being able to cope i mean we've i think we've managed quite well we separated our hospital into hospital staff and um ambulatory staff so tried to you know not have a cross contamination amongst amongst the staff there and um, you know, everyone's still working in masks when we're in close proximity to each other. So in surgery, obviously, you'd be in masks anyway, but, you know, we're taking x-rays and doing 
jobs where you're less than two meters um, with each other, then then that's being being adhered to. Again, um, you know, clients aren't aren't coming into the hospital. It's just drop your horse off and 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 go really. So um, I, we're coping well, I'd say. And you know, business has been thankfully busy during during the the, the pandemic thus far, but. Um, you know, racing, racing in Ireland stopped for um, around 76 days there. It's just resumed uh, nearly two weeks ago there now. So we're, our racing's back and going. So um, obviously our, our stud work was busy, but our racing work had, had dropped off and that should, should come back now with us so, and is coming back now. Hence why I was like getting on to the meeting. Oh, no, no, no worries. Are there still crowds at the at the um, sites, or is it? Right, racing is happening behind closed doors. So the only okay. people that are there are essential personnel. So the vets are there, the regulatory people are there. Um, obviously, the horses, one groom per horse. Your jockeys, uh, no one over seventy is currently allowed there. Although that oh, wow. rule is being eased uh, come Monday. Um, but uh, you know there, there are definite restrictions. The, you know the jockeys have a little spot to stand on where they're meant to stand in the parade ring, and um, you know the, your trainer, if he's under seventy, uh, is allowed to stand. You know has a spot two meters away from the jockey spot to stand. So it's all um, you know, adhering to social distancing, and and obviously the you know, the jockeys are, are are wearing masks up until they go down in the race they they don't have to wear them during the race but most people most jockeys are wearing them to be honest when they're racing oh wow wow that is interesting um mm -hmm. all right so mm -hmm. you've had a quite illustrious career and um experience in traveling and um gaining education all over the place so can you tell us about your journey to be um your journey um through veterinary medicine to get involved in this area of equine medicine and then um, what yeah. led you to this specific area as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, obviously just, um, you know, I, I'd always been, you know, had horses and was working with them prior to getting into veterinary. I, you know, I knew I wanted to do something in, in the horse field and, and, you know, science and everything else in, interested me. So why not be a vet? So I, I did veterinary and um, that, that was, you yeah. It's probably I should be more passionate about the way I got into there, but that's that's sort of how how I uh, fell into the the course. And um, I I went up, so I did a year of science at Melbourne University, trying to get into veterinary, and then um, didn't get into that. I was too much partying when I was at, <laughs> in first year uni, so I didn't get into Melbourne, and and uh, thankfully got into Queensland University there. So. I went up to Queensland and um, had had a lot of fun in Queensland as well. Um, but uh, you know, did my veterinary degree, got interested in the horses, um, you know, just the the equine medicine and surgery stuff. Probably around uh, third year, I think I was, you know, I was busy doing other other fun uni things really for the <laughs> for the first three years and rowing and water skiing and all manner of things that oh, you can wow. do when you're in. In, in Brisbane it's a great city to to live in um but you know, got quite interested we we had um you know some very good equine lecturers there uh Chris Pollitt and Andrew Van Epps and the Andrews over at um the new Bolton Centre now uh but um you know we just was was helping out with the 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 horse stuff um in it was probably actually the end of the third year third year and fourth year and fifth year there so um, was attending Andrew's hospital on on weekends and just helping with the horses there. And then um, we, you know, I I had a, Chris Pollard had organised for me to go down to the Hunter Valley um, in in Scone to to see see studs because I'd not really had any um, you know thoroughbred experience apart from my sister owning a few, but none none as a you know, veterinary perspective. So went down to Colin Grove Stud in the Hunter Valley and um, actually met my husband there, who's an equine vet. Uh, so that influenced things a bit. Um, so I was doing pra practical experience down in the Hunter Valley uh, at a stud there. So Colin Grove and um, 
ended up going over to in fourth year, uh, took a little bit of time out from uni, which the lecturers were really happy about. And so spent four weeks over in Newmarket there. Uh, so that's where my now husband was was practicing. So I went and saw practice there for for four weeks, which was interesting. And um, you know, just just uh, kept the uh, lit the flame for for equine medicine and surgery, I suppose. So um, I I did some practical experience at Scone Veterinary Hospital in in the Hunter Valley, uh, or managed to organise experience there, and also, um, so the following in fourth year, experience, work experience for three, three or four weeks, in addition, my husband, or well, now husband, being, being down in Scone, so uh, as mad as things get there, I, in fourth year, and fifth year, when, you know, during the stud season, so he, he was shuttling back and forward, um, as a vet with the you know with the stud season so he uh, in the in the during the spring there um, I would drive down to the Hunter Valley from Brisbane which is about a nine hour drive there uh, on on the weekends that I managed to organize um, organize my rotations to fit fit the tra travel arrangements there so um, I go down to get you know experience with with the horses with the stud folds and everything so that was Great. I also um, got some work experience at Randwick Equine Centre, which um, through that ended up getting offered the internship there for when I graduated. So I went from um, you know doing a fair bit of uh, travelling up and down between Brisbane and Scone, uh, time with Scone Equine Host Scone Vet Hospital, and and Randwick Equine Centre, and as I say, ended up doing my internship for. A, a year down in in Randwick Equine Centre, um, which is in Sydney, and and basically you know predominantly race when I was there, predominantly race horses, thoroughbreds. Uh, Randwick Race Course was was um, you know thriving with trainers, and you know you you had some of Australia's best trainers there: Bart Cummings, Gay Waterhouse, um, you know to name a few there, and you know we were doing all of their work um, in. In the hospital so you know horses it was a, a great internship there um two interns uh sam hurricane who is is working in the states as well i think he's he's currently at new bolton center was at um cornell ruffian center and ohio prior to that so uh you know a, a good year of interns for randwick we've both gone on to be specialists um there so a, a year is internship in in Randwick and then I went over to um, Newmarket Equine Hospital my um, husband was by that stage working back in Ireland um, there but I I uh, spent six months um, working under Ian Wright uh, doing orthopedic stuff there pretty much lamenesses and more lamenesses <laughs> and and helping us scrubbing into surgeries on on weekends as the assistant you know his assistant there um so that was fantastic and then um after that i i was looking to get a residency and needed needed to get some first opinion practice under my belt so i you know i was interviewing for residencies and they were like you you know you don't have first opinion experience and I was, um, yeah, I'll go and get some. So I, I did, did that. I did some locuming for a bit, and then um, had a job in in Blair Court Equine Hosp Equine Clinic in um, just outside of London there in Essex, and you know, it, that taught me a lot uh, in terms of you know, client management and you know, as much as um, you know, it's it's a lot simpler type of practice vaccinations and lameness as the bosses there were great and you know let me run with doing you know more surgeries than you'd expect of a two year out uh, or year and a half out um vesh and working up the lamenesses and and stuff so they they were excellent and then within uh six months i had a a residency up at a residency offer up at the university of edinburgh um doing the uh, equine surgery residency so it was uh, focused on um, equine surgery but I also had a, 
a master's in equine respiratory medicine and surgery um, that I did. So uh, we did a lot of lower airway um, medicine and also uh, upper airway surgery there. Obviously did my master's in respiratory, um, the muscles of the, of the soft palate there. So that was all a bit of fun as well. Uh, a lot of looking down a microscope, uh, processing samples, reading them, interpreting them. Um, and you know, it just, it, whilst I was in the residency, I'd be coming back and forward to, to Ireland, um, on weekends off. So I was also, um, getting exposed to, to doing, uh, surgeries under supervision <laughs> over here on weekends. And, uh, um you know we we were it was it was quite quite good um and just you know getting like my my husband works as a equine vet as well he he does more reproductive and you know general racing stuff so stud stud medicine and 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 some racing stuff once the stud bit stud bits dry up and you know sales work so um I mean, it's it's a it's been a natural evolution there. But um, you know, during the residency, also did a lot of um, race track work as well. So at the races there, as the university um, provided cover for Musselburgh Race Course, which was probably the um, one of the busiest ones in Scotland at the time there. So I think we would have done around thirty race meetings, and I never said no to to going going racing. So um, you know, it was bit of extra money and uh, and you know always a bit of fun there so um no that was was good and um you know just built the the desire to be involved in the in the industry and kept it kept it going and then um obviously as part of the the residency you're working towards um getting the specialist status so um the diplomat of the European College of Vet Surgeons similar to your ACBS um qualification there so um i once i finished my residency in october 2009 i came over to ireland and started working at sikkim lodge equine hospital so the and um, basically the um the worst bit i suppose of the global financial crisis i was um i was moving jobs and coming to ireland which was you know one of the the worst hit countries uh in terms of uh, the economy there so it was a bit quiet but um at the start but you know built up from a practice that was doing around 100 you know surgeries there and uh, um you know under a million turnover to to one that's doing around you know 350 surgeries and wow. doubled our number of staffs and more than doubled our turnover there in the 10 years that i've been here wow that is yeah. amazing. That's an amazing journey. Mm. And I like how you, yeah. you know, when you saw that you needed something to, um, some more experience in something, instead of trying to keep pushing, you said, okay, let me stop. Let me go back, get this experience that they want, and then let me continue. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Um, all right. So obviously you're working with multiple um, industries within this racing, within mm -hmm. the racing industry itself, you're working with multiple industries and you have to have partnerships with the number of people. Can you describe your approach and your philosophy to um, equine medicine and um, how do your experiences inform your approach? Um, I, I mean, I suppose the, the approach to equine medicine and, and surgery and, and our job here is always you know, the priority you, um, I remember one of the clients coming in here and going in a circle to get to your answer. One of the clients coming in and, you know, say, saying something, uh, you know, derogatory about, uh, what, what was, what was happening and, you know, and, you know, I'm the client and I'm you know, the most important person here. And I said, oh, wait a minute there, the, the most important Thing here is your horse and the welfare of your horse and I think that's the the and he, he sort of stopped checked and said actually you're right um, <laughs> so uh, you know that that uh, that that is the the foundation for for the way that I practice you know veterinary medicine and you know what all you know what we're doing you know obviously we're running a business and that has to be functional you, you, we're not running a charity and it can't be you know run that way or else no no one's kids eat 
for me. Um, and but the the basis of how we we you know, we run and I run is is that the the horse comes first, and and you know any decisions that are made are always made with the horse's welfare as the as the first um, point um, there. So um, I think that's just been born out of you know, respect for the animals and and an understanding of 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 you know that of what what our role is here. You know we're not you know we're not here to necessarily you know do what do what a trainer wants and often in in racing that can be you know a balance of you know not alienating your your customers but you know at the same time the 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 reason why you are there is to is to promote the welfare of the animal and make sure that you know you're doing the right thing by by that animal there and also uh, as a knock-on effect the right thing by your client Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, can you tell us about Sycamore Equine Lodge and how your clinic engages and serves the community? Because you're you're in the midst of it. You're right there in the heart of it. And so, um, how does tell us about the clinic and then um, how they serve the community? Um, I we we obviously you know provide employment for over twenty people in the in the local community. We actually have um, you know more than we have quite an international uh, workforce here, so I mean there there are a few imports, myself included. Um, in terms of our support of the community, obviously um, we we support the the race course in our you know providing veterinary services to race day. Um, we support the you know, the local training grounds there um, by providing veterinary backup. We I mean over over here we have. Um, there's a program for uh, uh, intellectually disadvantaged um, people uh, there who you may have learning difficulties or difficulties integrating into to normal workplaces or normal situations. So we we have a, a member of staff who um, who is is under that program there, and you know it's great to see awesome. see her. Um, come into work it gives you know she has a job here and you know it, it's a program that's been um was promoted to me through my sister-in-law who has a child with down syndrome and you know it, it's a really um good thing that the practice can do to give back to to our local community obviously it's not just just one that's dealing with um racehorses but um sam likes the racing she likes the horses and is um you know is a actually lives in the town closest to where i live there as well so you know the village as we're driving past you know it, it's it's nice to have that local connection to to the practice and the and our our local village as well and being at be supporting um you know it, it's only one person on a local level but if every business um, did it then you know there wouldn't be an issue with with having um, you know, these people integrated in into the uh oh oh no all right guys I think she accidentally um technical difficulties and got out there on us let me see if I can bring her back give me one second There we go. Sorry, Will. Sorry, that no, just cut good. off there. <laughs> you are perfectly fine. <laughs> Sorry, the problem is having it on the phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. All right, we're bringing you back. Yeah. Perfect. Let me see if I can spotlight the video again. All right, perfect. And so um, you were just mentioning some of the programs that you all have to support um, 
some of some of the initiatives that the community is um, engaged in. I think that's that's awesome. That's an awesome yeah. um, opportunity that you all are providing. And you know, one of the key yeah. is you know that. And oh no, what were you saying? And you know, I mean, there, there's other things that we do as we're supporting our, um, our our veterinarians with you know backup in terms of you know be it a a phone call or you know just just support in um, you know providing case support as well. You know, they may not be sending cases into me, but just you know a, a near to chat to and and an opinion to offer, and that that I think is important. I mean, as a practice, we also support the 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 courier as well in in sponsoring races there as well but you know i think in terms of our our community and you know not just being a, an isolated equine only response i think our our involvement with the care program um there is has been you know particularly beneficial to to the community and and you know it's a sort of and, and act local and and think global policy as I say if everyone if everyone did it then um then it would be uh, you know, we wouldn't have so as many social problems yeah no that's real that's real yeah. um all right so moving to this next question um you deal with in i think anything that's dealing with high impact performance is a lot of pressure right and um you're dealing in one of the yeah 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 one of the highest to me stressful situations in in dealing with um performance um horses and so can you describe to us the things that are like most challenging for you in your career i think you know i like I, with age and experience comes a a, a certain perspective you know perspective there and i think you know our younger vets um particularly might find that pressure um you know overwhelming at times and i think it's you know a lot of the time it's the the type of person that's doing veterinary is one that's going to you know they're they're used to excelling in everything they do and expect to be you know have high expectations of themselves and you know you you're probably perfectionists and you know want everything done properly and you know to a high standard and you know, place pretty high expectations on yourself and i know that that would you know, would be would have been the place that I was in there um but I think with with experience and maturity and you know having perspective you, you know have kids and realize that you know yes yes this is a three million euro racehorse but you know at the end of the day uh you know my kids are you know very important to me and you know that yes if you know you, you need to be able to take a step back at times and, and appreciate that, you know, you do your best and you're not going to save every animal and you're not going to get the outcomes that you desire in every, every case there. And despite what you do, and um, sometimes uh, it may be something that you do, but you know, you, you can learn from your mis mistakes, but you don't let them define you. You learn from it, you park it and you move on. Um, otherwise you, you know, you can end up, letting letting small issues you know turn into bigger issues and and you know we as a profession need to look after our mental health and i think sometimes placing too much pressure on yourselves um can be uh detrimental to your own health and not something that you you know that is beneficial yes you have to be always striving to do do your best but in that understand that sometimes your best and anyone's best isn't going to be good enough to to save um every animal or come to a to an excellent outcome and i think if you can um the term the easier it is to to keep developing professionally and and to you know enjoy the job there because if you're if you're stressing about things and you're anxious about you know how how you're you're doing then you know you could it can be a negative thing yes a little bit of um care and attention to detail and i'm not saying don't don't have these qualities and you know always striving to to do your best and and you know reviewing things in a critical manner that that allows you to to get better and and making sure that you take on any constructive criticisms there 
in a in a positive way but you know i i would um have no qualms in pointing out to people you know how to do things better what what i see in in you know my assessment of of the case and and how i would manage it but you know it's it's always to be in a positive manner so that they are learning and are able to do do it to the same level that i would do it so i mean i you know i i think your mental well-being is an important um thing for vets and something that you know can be um overlooked there as well and maybe in in college people you know students come out of, of college or young vets come out of college and um they're you know they, they expect that they're going to be able to do everything and and be brilliant at it and yes there are certain things they're going to be able to do but you know you, you're still learning and you know i'm still learning i i'm you know 40 years old and been a, an equine vet for the last 17 years and you know i'm you know, the old dog can still learn a few new tricks but um you know you you do have to have a certain level of confidence in yourself that you know I did my best. I've, you know, I've done it, and that's it. You know, and and I think that a lot of the you know, if you have that that um, perspective there, then you're you're able to um, you know, you don't you don't let things get to you so much. That's awesome. That's something that I think. You know, is that be a question there? No, no, that answers a question. That's something that I, everybody needs to hear. <laughs> everybody, everybody. Sorry, I think that there is a lot of there, there there is a lot of pressure there, and you know, there'd, there'd always be expectations from your trainers and and whatnot. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if it's a kid's pony that you know they they love dearly, or or a you know wealthy individual who's had the the the, the fortune. The, the misfortune to have spent three million dollars on something that's you know putting its feet down through its soles of it you know and got laminitis and there's nothing you can do flying in farriers from all around the world and and whatnot like if it's if they're gonna die you know our our job is to make sure that they don't suffer along the way and to to you know make the decisions that you know at the time are pretty hard but you just have to you know make it and move on that's awesome that's awesome all right um before we get to the questions i have um one more question for you and so um you literally have a global perspective um to veterinary medicine because of the education route that you you've taken and mm -hmm. your lived experiences so can you describe to us why having a global perspective is important for veterinary professionals Um, I, you know, it, it, it gives you a lot of experience and you, there's, 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 you know, you, you can, um, be able to say, you know, well, like we don't see this kind of injury in Australian racehorses and, you know, why am I seeing it so often in England? It gives you a very good understanding of disease process processes there um it like it gives you a, a nice experience of different cultures and um people as well so you know i like i was in grew up in australia and didn't do much traveling there but like i i've been to most parts of the world obviously haven't been haven't been to south america but um you know i i've been to the united states been to you know places around europe um like it's just you know fantastic to be able to be able to you know travel to places it doesn't necessarily have to be with work but your location that you're in you get to see you know different places meet different people it it really does give you a a great perspective and and um a, a good rounding there and more than just being a, a well-rounded vet it's it's about getting you know your experiences and and enjoying enjoying yourself and and seeing all the amazing things that you know there are to see in the world and um you know if, if you can travel around you get to see a fair bit yeah yeah all right so 
at this moment, we're going to open it up um, for questions with Dr. Hawks. And so um, you can either type in the Zoom group chat and I can read it out, or you can unmute your microphones and video and ask the question. So it's, it's either one. Um, but right now we're gonna open it up for questions, questions. All right, so we have a question from Becca. She says, do you still have time to ride your horses? <laughs> no, I don't have time to still ride my horses at this point in time. I, I get the, the kids to have two ponies there, so I get uh, time to run along beside them at the moment. And um, I, yeah, I, I have aspirations to get a, a, a horse, although I, um, I made a small deal with my husband that I'd get a fast car instead of <laughs> having a horse. So I've got the fast car and I've had that for a few years. So it has a horse on the badge, but you know, I think riding, uh, riding, a, riding a real horse has, still has its appeal. So it's gonna have to renegotiate that one. <laughs> All right, so we have another question from Ashley. Um, she said, what is your favorite part about dealing with sports medicine and what advice would you have for people who want to go into that part of veterinary medicine? So I'm just struggling to hear, hear the question properly, but what advice would I have to, to get into equine medicine? I think getting experience, um, you know, handling experience from um, you know if you if you're if you're struggling to to handle a horse, then you're going to struggle to be an equine vet. So get get handling experience. Go to a, a thoroughbred stud. Spend spend the summer there, or you know, a yearling preparation there. So spare time. Make sure you 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 can you have good handling experience so that you can. Um, do what you need to do as a veterinarian and, and develop the the common sense and intention to to be handling horses. Once you have that experience, you're you're useful going into equine practice. So you're you're able to hold a foal. Um, you know you you know not to be standing at the the kicking end of the horse and um, you know good good handling and being able to then go on and and see practice um, with a veterinarian. And I think. It's good to develop a, a relationship with, um, you know, a practice there, so that they know you, they're familiar with you, and you know, let you get more experience. So doing more, um, more stuff. I think going and spending a week with a practice there and a veterinarian, um, you know, as an isolated experience is is difficult to improve your skills and and you know, make make it that you're you know, to develop yourself there. So, I mean, I think in America, they have better um, hands-on skills there for your students in the universities, but over here, um, you know, making sure that your students get hands-on experience. And the best way to do that is for the vets to, to be familiar with you and um, and get your experience there. And, you know, maybe choose a, choose a practice that, you know, you might like to work at because they're, they're much more likely to hire you if, if, if they know you and you've impressed them. Hmm. And I want to get to her first part of the question was, what is your favorite part about dealing with sports medicine? Um, I think the the variety there. So I, I mean, I can like, you know, no, no day is the same there. And I mean, I, I like, yeah, I, I like the, the respiratory stuff. It's, it's, you know, you get a bit of a kick out of seeing it horse go out and, and win a big race there so that I like that if you know you've helped help that animal achieve its full potential um to be honest I I you know I get a, a fair kick out of you know having a say saving an animal in, with respect to say you know a colleague or um you know 
colleagues are probably the most satisfying. Obviously, they can be the, um, you know, some of them don't end in a satisfying uh, <laughs> scenario, but, um, you know, they are pretty impressive when you can, you know, intervene surgically and, you know, change the outcome for that horse. So it's something that was going to die if you didn't operate and, you know, you pretty simple, you operate and, and it, it saves it there. So that that's probably the most satisfying bit, I think. So it's not more, it's, it's less sports medicine than, uh, than, than, than equine medicine and surgery. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So Sarah, Sarah asked, how do you find a work-life balance? I know that's an issue for many equine vets and I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Um, I, you know, I, I struck, you know, be dishonest to say that you don't struggle with it. Um, I, mean, I, I'm, searching for a better work-life balance and um you know the the solution is having um more staff and you know suitably qualified people to to be able to do the same job that i do so that i can get get a rotor and and get uh time off so um you're entering into a into practice where you know you do have a reasonable rotor um or get you, you you're working towards a reasonable rotor is is a uh, desirable so um to to answer it truthfully i don't have a great work life balance i i work too much and um i i'm in the process of hiring another surgeon at the moment uh there so um you know that that will improve things but you know in terms of how how have i coped for the last 10 years being the only surgeon on call getting locums when I, um, you know, for maternity leave and then also taking holidays there, um, just just doing things when, you know, the, there's no point as far as, like, I've been on call for quite a long, long time. So, I mean, uh, not drinking too much helps um, and, you know, living locally. But, like, I wouldn't let being on call or, or the threat of, of having something come in there stop me going out for dinner and you know taking the kids to the zoo and to be honest if I get a call well I just change what I'm doing and not let that annoy me so I mean you know people can stress over getting you know being on call and wait sitting at home for the phone to ring and have to go out and you know do things and it's all you know they're they're uh they're letting work rule their life. But I mean, yes, I, I do plenty of hours of work, but I don't let that uh, get in the way of what I do. And as I say, if I happen to get a call and have to change what I'm doing, well, so be it. But um, yeah, I have some understanding kids and I, I won't lie. There's, um, you know, uh, there's been, there's been a scenario where I was putting the kids to bed and it's a weekend and the nanny who would look, after them you can stay in the house or home and a seat a col uh, no a folding and I had to go in and had kids crying in the car while I'm doing a cesarean so I the, not parenting tips for you <laughs> guys um, nor you should aspire to but you just have to do come up and you know do your best and and not be too tormented by it. Excellent, excellent. So, I guess for so. I, I I have an I have an excellent nanny who um, has been with me over seven years there, and I and she um, this, this is embarrassing. She looks after my kids. She cleans the house. She does the washing. She changes the bed sheets. She does everything um, for me. So. Like without her, I wouldn't be able to do my job there. So um, we're kind of like you know, dual mums there mm -hmm. to the kids. But, um, you know, as I say, if, if there's one person I wouldn't be able to do my job without, that's her. That's good. You need both jobs. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. Exactly. She's <laughs> probably a better mother than me too. <laughs> um, all right. So we have a question from Morgan. Morgan asks, what are the most common cases you see at your clinic? Does your clinic also help with a lot of preventive care exercise as well as treating injuries? 
Um, we would, I mean, obviously the hospital is um, referral center as well as, you know, like I'd be seeing the more specialist cases. So the ambulatory vets would send things in. So um, do we, we, we don't do like, I mean, maintenance there for the thoroughbreds and racing yards. Yes. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd have a list of horses to, to be trotting up there to, to assess, you know, and, and see on a regular basis how they are, um, you know, performance enhancement. I think, you know, we, we're veterinary in Ireland and England and probably Europe is, you know, for racehorses is more conservative than it would be in the U S you know, we're not medicating joints, you know, they don't have to get their joints done every two weeks or every four weeks or anything. We're, you know, much more um, less medicine based uh, or less reliant on our medications that over, over here, I feel. Um, so there's less of a role for vets in that way. And I think, you know, it, it comes back to doing what's right for the horse there. Um, you're running, giving them, loading them up with butte so that they can race or, you know, keeping on medicating joints that, that clearly aren't coping with the demands being placed on them is, is not of benefit to them. And I suppose with the sport horse um, sector, so you show jumping, dressage and other horses, yes, we would do some work, but that's not the majority of work that, that I do. Um, so I have a few clients that, that I deal with the higher level um, sports your professional sports horses there that yes you'd have an input into that and the you know shoeing management advice and and other bits but it's not a, a big feature of of our practice here awesome awesome um we have an aspiring veterinarian um Keishla. i'm sorry if i butchered that name and um, please forgive me what was it like moving often while having a family, how do you cope with it? Any advice for aspiring international vets? Um, well, obviously, I, I, I suppose I was a little bit of a free spirit as a child. So, you know, I'd, I'd take my pony and be at a friend's house and not really, you know, inform parents or anything like that. Um, so, uh, you know, leaving my family in Australia and um, I you know I'd, I'd moved out by the time I was um, 18 I was moved out of home there so I was away from, you know Queensland's obviously um, about a 24-hour drive from home in Victoria there so I was kind of away from them for, for vet school there and um, then you're know, going over to, to England was, you know, just a bit of, a bit of fun. So like, you'd have to have a bit of sense of adventure and, you know, the, the fact that you can phone home and, and whatnot is, is um, great, uh, you know, keeping in touch with people. But um, I, you know, I haven't, um, you know, I've been in the job that I'm in for the last 10 years. So um, in terms of having a, a family and, and kids, you know, I haven't been moving jobs with kids. And I think, um, you know, uh, as I say to the the kids, you know, the, what's the most important for you know thing that a a child needs? That's love, and I suppose part of your know, love for a child is is that you provide them with stability and consistency. There, so I mean, I think you know, even though I work too much, the the kids still know that um, they're loved and they have have that consistency there. And if you know if if you can provide that and be traveling well so and good but um you know it 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 all your perspective how you portray that across to your children and if you know if they're you know if they're moving schools or whatnot and, and that's a part of the adventure then that's great but you know i think it's um it it's probably more difficult to be um traveling the world and and having kids um particularly if they're they're of a school age there um then you know it's kind of something that you um is easier done when you don't have the the um responsibility of children there yeah <laughs> all right um so what we're going to do right now 
um, first off, Dr. Hawks, thank you so much um, for taking time out of your day to talk with our students, to talk with um, our alumni about your experiences um, as a veterinarian there, as an equine surgeon veterinarian at that, um, there in Kildare. We truly appreciate it. Students, you have the opportunity, hopefully in their new future when travel restrictions are, um, are off for both countries, <laughs> Um, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to um, complete an internship um, there um, at, the, at the Sycamore Equine Lines. It's an amazing opportunity. Our students that have um, done it have loved it. Um, and so you can, you can be there with Dr. Hawks and her wonderful team there. Um, at this time, what we want to do is if you all can take your videos off and we're going to do like a screenshot picture. Um, so if you're comfortable and your rooms are clean and you feel confident. <laughs> um, <laughs> a few people are leaving. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you, thank you. You can open those videos. You know, it, get, it gets awkward because you have to hold your smiles for a little bit as I, um, as I screenshot it. But big, beautiful smiles. Yes, yes. All right. And if you're having trouble with the video, all right, we got some more people. Let's see, here we go. Oh my goodness, look at those. We miss you guys so much. Can't wait for you all to come back, even <laughs> though you probably have masks and shields on. Still can't wait for you all to come back. All right, so at this time, I want you all to give a big cheese to the camera and um, hold it for as long as you can. <laughs> as I <laughs> to snap this picture. All right, one, two, three. All right, all right, let me see how this turned out. Are we good? All right, let me save this one. All right, we're gonna do it one more time. I usually like to just have two on deck. All right. So we're gonna do it one more time. All right, here we go. One, two, three. All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. Excellent, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me finish your applause. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. We will see you all at our next one. And thank you, Dr. Hawks, for everything. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. We'll see. Bye-bye. All right. <laughs> Good going there from me, <laughs> trying to get the... I don't know how to stop this thing. <laughs> no, no, it's perfectly <laughs> There you go. No, it's got, got a leave button now. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thanks for that. See you. Bye-bye. All right. How do I stop this?